So I think at some point, most of you guys out there have probably heard about this mysterious island in the Indian Ocean where this tribe lives that just shoots intruders on sight. Anyone who approaches the island, who tries to trade or be friendly to them, gets shot in the past, bodies had to be retrieved off the coast and stuff. And they just have this, this reputation of being quite ruthless when it comes to anyone approaching the island. And I stumbled across this picture on Reddit that basically says, hey, do you know who probably doesn't have a single case of COVID? That island of people who shoot intruders with arrows on sight. God bless them. And I hope they're doing well. <laughs> now that's a sentiment I can identify with, right? I think most of us can. If we're at work, someone wants something from us, why can't we just like arrow them down, right? You're intruding my space, take them down. But no, in all honesty, this is a picture that sent me down a rabbit hole because I wanted to know what is this about? Is this just like a crazy cannibal tribe that just has fun murdering intruders? Or is there more to it? And it turns out, there's much more to it. And some people have done extensive research. So in this video, we're gonna go through some of this research, which by the way, is really, really exciting because it really breaks down how it came to the point why these people are the way they are. At least it's an attempt of understanding. And I mean, there are obvious reasons, like for example, immunity to diseases that wouldn't do anything to us, like flu or a cold or something, would we'll probably murder them because they don't have the antibodies to protect themselves from that. So clearly that's one of the reasons, probably they had bad experience with that in the past, but there's much, more to it. But let's look at the geography for a second. Uh, it kind of the island is not big, right? It, it sits right here between uh, India on the left and Thailand, Myanmar on the right. You can see it's, it's right here. It's called North Sentinel Island. Someone left a five star review on Google Maps. And I doubt that person was really there to judge whether it's a five star experience to be on that island because if you're a stranger, then probably it's not a five star experience. But the island is small. It's maybe like four and a half kilometers across, five and a half kilometers from top to bottom, something like that. So it's not big. And the stories that nobody ever made contact with them are also not true. There's this article on National Geographic, uh, which talks about a woman who made you know contact with the most isolated tribes in the world. And this, this particular tribe was one of them. There's also a video on YouTube of people approaching them and uh, in a boat and giving them coconuts because apparently coconuts don't grow natively on the island. So this is a bit of a treat for them and uh, you know, there's a friendly interaction. They are approaching the boat. These people are not leaving the boat. They stay on the boat. So they're not literally intruding on their land. And I think it's pretty clear that they just wanna give them the coconuts and then they're leaving again. And under those terms, there is this little exchange, you know, and they're not aggressive. They don't shoot any arrows at them. So looking at this, it's, it's pretty clear that they are not purely hostile. And I think to an extent, it's understandable that these kind of people protect their territory from intruders because maybe they are just very aware of you know, what tourism does to an island like that, and it would ruin pretty much everything that they hold sacred. And I will link all these articles and the videos down in the description so you can go and have a look at them for yourself. It's, it's really interesting how these kind of two worlds meet. And by the way, the island is protected by the Indian government. Like they don't let anyone get close to it. There's no tourism, no boat can even get close to the island. It's literally forbidden by law. So the government supports them. And that's another thing we're gonna talk about later, how it came to that point that the Indian government uh, is actually completely on their side and respects their isolation. Then there are also memes like this. Maybe you've seen this, this airplane with arrows hitting from underneath. And this is an art piece. It's not an actual aeroplane that flew over the island, but it somehow has become like an icon uh, that people take whenever they talk about this island, because maybe that's what you would expect. They are so hostile, right? It's such an expression of hostility, all these arrows hitting the plane. But what it says underneath is interesting because it says, nope, apparently they still don't want to talk about Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll try again tomorrow. And while that is just a mediocre joke or a meme, there is actually a 26 year old man called John Shaw, who in 2018 thought it's a good idea to bring a Bible to the island to convert those poor non-believers to Christianity. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Imagine thinking that's a good idea. Imagine thinking that you imposing your weird Western belief system on a tribe that has never held a book in their life, probably. It's just absurd. So anyway, this guy guy went there and he was well aware that it might not end well. He, he kind of wrote a journal and one of the entries said, I hope this isn't my last note, but if it is, do not retrieve my body. That was a message to his family. And if you read the comments, people are actually leaving quite interesting little details of this story. So for example, he was waving a Bible and an arrow hit it. He then backed off and came back later. 
If an arrow hitting your Bible isn't a sign of God from being like, yo, chill, then what is? <laughs> and someone replies, well, only listen to God when he agrees with you. Otherwise, it's a test of your faith. You can literally not lose. <laughs> That's true. But imagine that you're approaching this tribe who has this reputation and you're waving a Bible, right? You're like, no, you need to learn about the word of God and an arrow hits your Bible, okay? And you're like, Oh, well, I'm going to try again tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> anyway, he did try again the next day and that was the day he died. But that kind of tells a story of actually more like a protective tribe rather than an aggressive tribe, right? Because they gave him a chance. They shot those warning arrows even through his Bible, making it very clear that they don't want him there. He decides to come back. Can you really then blame them for taking him out? It's pretty clear that that was a mistake and he just didn't read the signs, the quite obvious signs. As an archer, I can say that hitting a Bible from any distance above 20 meters is a freaking crack shot. And with a basic longbow type to boot, I doubt that we're actually aiming for the Bible. Maybe they were not aiming for the Bible, but they hit that Bible, which is it's quite impressive. I mean, they didn't hit him at this point. They only hit the Bible. I think it was pretty clearly warning shots at this point. So you might wonder, how did he even get there, right? Because there are no boats, nobody's allowed. So he bribed people in boats to get there and, and paid them a lot of money, apparently like two years of their wages basically to get him close to that island and then he kind of had a camp there so he always went back to that camp wrote those notes and then went back trying to convert them to to the religion so the whole thing is a bad idea spoiler he didn't make it you know he he didn't survive his body was never retrieved and here's an entry from his journal uh, which apparently happened one day before his death and uh, he went back to his kayak after this encounter where they hit his bible and wrote this into uh, his journal and as I said before he then went back the next day well I've been shot by the Sentinelese I hope I'm saying this right this is the name of the indigenous people by a kid probably about 10 or so years old maybe a teenager short compared to those who looked like adults he wrote the little kid shot me with an arrow directly into my bible which I was holding at my chest Oh my God, like the, the arrow gets stuck in the Bible you're holding in your chest, you go through that experience and you still think it's a good idea to come back. This guy really is, has trust in his faith. Recalling his near-death experience in his journal that evening, he wrote, Father, forgive him and any of the people on this island who tried to kill me and especially forgive me if they succeed. So again, he was very aware what he was getting himself into and he did end his own life in this way. So I guess it was a test of his face. And, you know, I mean, just don't mess with these people. That's the lesson here. Just don't mess with these people. But now we're coming to, to this little Twitter thread, which really sheds some light on why these people are the way they are. This is from a guy called Respectable Law. And uh, I'll link the Twitter thread and all this down in, in the description. So, you, again, you can read up on it yourself. Uh, but this, I think, is in response to this 2018 incident we just spoke about. There's been a lot of talk about the missionary killed by the natives of North Sentinel Island. They're probably so aggressive because of this weirdo, Maurice Vidal Portman. So here's a big thread about this creep and some facts from my decade-long obsession with the island. And here we have him. Apparently, that is Maurice Vidal Portman. And uh, he says, the Sentinelese are often described as uncontacted, but this is not strictly true. They had a very significant contact in 1818 with Commander Portman. Portman, the black sheep, third son of some minor noble, was assigned by the English Royal Navy to administer and pacify the Andaman Islands, a job he pursued from 1880 to 1900 with the full measure of his own perversity. So, so here we get a picture of him on a throne. I find these pictures so freaking disturbing, man. How can you sit there as the white man on a throne? I mean, I get it. It's 1880, okay? It's a while ago. Things were different back then. But again, you know, everyone's wearing like the little crosses. Like we have to convert you to Christianity because that's the only truth. Just people are completely delusional. So Portman was erotically obsessed with the Andamanese. So apparently that's, I think, the whole island group or something. And he indulged in his passion for photography by kidnapping members of various tribes and posing them in mock Greek homoerotic composites. So this weirdo comes to this island and he's clearly gay, you know, nothing wrong with that, but he has this obsession with, with these, these naked tribesmen and he poses them in these weird homoerotic poses. 
I mean, what's wrong with you, bro? And it doesn't end there. It keeps going. During his 20 years in a sexualized heart of darkness, Portman measured and cataloged every inch of his prisoner's bodies with an obsessive focus on genitals. So here's a little paragraph from a report that described what happened at the time on that island. Lending support to Mary Louise Pretz, 1985, notion of bodyscape in the colonial gaze Male genitalia appear to have been a particular point of fascination for Portman and Molesworth. All right, I guess that that's his colleague. One man is described as having atrophied testicles, both being hard but the size of hatch sparrows' eggs. The same individual is also marked by observation. His wiener is small, and I'm changing the words here, he didn't write wiener, is small with a moderate size prepos. His wiener is larger than usual, summarizes a man named Churko. TLI is described as the chief of Interview Island and a man of considerable authority and intelligence, but also equipped with a bad temper and genitals that are fully developed but small. So he's like, oh, here's this tribe, right? We're all looking at the tribe. Let's research the tribe. You know what? Let's just focus on their genitals. Let's just look what's between their legs because surely that is what this tribe is all about. So extremely weird, man. I don't, I don't know where this was going, what he was thinking at the time. Just imagine being a Neolithic person spending a few weeks in this guy's rotating menagerie. I mean... Dude, I, I, this, I mean, uh, I mean, honestly, I mean, this whole colonial stuff, we see a lot of these things, all right? It's not the only case, but it's weird. It's, it's weird and it gets weirder. Portman spent most of his time in the greater Andaman Islands, but in 1880, he landed on North Sentinel. So now he's, he's actually coming to this island that we're talking about. The natives fled and his party ventured inland to find a settlement which had been abandoned in haste. But they located an elderly couple and a few children they were able to abduct. The couple quickly died, likely from ailments to which they had no immunity. So, you know, they quickly caught some virus that just slaughtered them. And the children spent a few weeks with Portman doing God knows what. After which he returned them to the island. Portman returned on a couple occasions, but the Sentinelese hid from him each time. The story related by the children was certainly passed down among the hundred or so inhabitants of the island. And even today, Portman's fatal kidnapping is just beyond a human lifetime. So probably these people remember, right? They remember what went on. I mean, may, I doubt that these children that were abducted by him are still alive. That might be a bit far-fetched. But I'm sure they keep telling these stories and this stuff kind of keeps alive on the island. So when the Indian government attempted to contact with the anthropologists in the 1960s and 70s, the Sentinelese were understandably hostile to outsiders. So that was the tipping point, right? This guy went there, he acted like a freaking pervert, abducted children, did God knows what with them, and then uh, that turned them hostile. And they were like, you know, that's what these guys from the outside world do? Well, F that, you know, we're not having any more of that. So the Indian government soon gave up. In 1980, a cargo ship named the Primrose ran aground on the coastal reef surrounding North Sentinel. The crew radiated for assistance and settled in for a long wait. But in the morning, they saw 50 men with bows on the beach building makeshift boats. <laughs> That's a bad situation, isn't it? You're stranded in this boat right next to this island and you know they're hostile. They don't like strangers. And you're like, ah, oh, well, someone's going to come to rescue us, like looking through binoculars. And you see them getting ready on boats, like trying to board you. And you're like, oh, no, this is not good. So here's a, here's a picture of that cargo ship. The crew called for an emergency airlift and were evacuated. And not a moment too soon. Rough waves had thwarted the Sentinelese in their attempt to board. But the weather was clearing. So they made it out. These are actually photos from the actual boat during the incident. You can see the island here in the background. It's another picture here. So so that's, I guess they're waiting. It's all the luggage here. They're waiting for the, for the pickup from the helicopter. And even today, you can still see that ship. There's a picture here, but we can also go to, to Google Maps and you can actually see, where was it? Somewhere up here. Oh yeah, there it is, right? This is the actual wreck of that cargo ship, which is still there today. The ship and its cargo were left at the island, awaiting discovery by Neolithic ice. Imagine climbing on board that ship. 
a completely alien vessel filled with alien things, imagine seeing simple machinery for the first time, a hinge, a latch, a wheel, things that would instantly make sense in a satisfying way. Others would be so incomprehensible to avoid notice, right? That must be crazy. That would literally be like us boarding an alien ship, right? If, if you're familiar with the story of Bob Lazar and he describes how alien it was to get into that spaceship, whether that's true or not, but that's how it must have been for these people. It's strange. It's the strangest thing. You've never seen anything that is comparable to what you're witnessing right now. I've never been able to find out what cargo was on the Primrose in all my years of reading. There was about 100 tons of some sort of consumer product on board and I'm curious what it was, but even absent the cargo, Think about all the things that must have been on that ship. That's true. It's not just the cargo. It's people leave like, I don't know, jackets, phones, cables, wires. There's so much stuff there that must have blown these, these natives' minds. In 1990, when anthropologists returned to the island to make new attempts of contact, they were met with a different attitude. Not friendly exactly, but they were willing to accept gifts. Many would wade into the water with smiles to accept the coconuts. We watched that video, so that was in the 1990s. And in those videos, you can see that those pre-Iron Age people now had metal weapons like the knife carried by this man. They had scavenged metal from the primrose and cold forged it into tools. Ain't that remarkable? Like they take metal, they find out how to melt it somehow to forge it and they turn it into tools for themselves. It's like a window into our own past, right? To where we all come from. It's absolutely crazy. After collecting gifts for a few minutes, a few members of the tribe would approach and make menacing gestures, signaling that it was time for the outsiders to leave. They have never lost their desire for isolation despite the gifts. And they remained consistent in their intolerance against intruders. In 2006, two fishermen were killed after drifting into the island when their anchor detached while they were sleeping. Oh boy, so we're sleeping on the boat. Boat drifted onto the island. These guys took it as an attempt of hostility, I don't know, and they just killed them. The Sentinelese were lucky. They were so effective at preventing contact. The neighboring Jawara, which is another tribe on a neighboring island, weren't so fortunate. The tribe went from 9,000 to a couple of hundred from lack of genetic immunity and only forestalled annihilation due to aggressive segregation. Their future is bleak. So you can see Actually, in the bigger picture, it's really, really smart to stay so isolated, right? That was a smart move. And if that takes that they have to kill every single person that comes to the island, at least they're protecting themselves, right? And to an extent, it kind of makes sense. I mean, just stay away. Just don't go there. It's not that hard, really. Yet on North Sentinel, they have maintained a small community for 60,000 years, which is by all indicators happy. There is no way to integrate them into, modern, into the modern world without wiping out nearly every member of their tribe. And their aggressiveness is not a mark of savagery. It is just that their conception of outsiders is mostly framed by some foot-faced English perverts who murdered some old people and did weird things to their kids. So let's do them a favor and leave them alone. <laughs> I like that one. Give it a like. Postscript. One of the great things about doing a thread like this is that some people show up with even more information. First, the son of the helicopter pilot from the Primrose rescue mission let me know that the cargo was chicken feed. It was chicken feed. My father, Captain Robert F., was one of the ones who airlifted those Primrose crew out and it was only later that they found out it was a lot of chicken feed. He did have some pretty interesting accounts of those experiences though. Someone also pointed out uh, towards a book uh, that describes a two-month salvage operation of the Primrose that was always certainly observed by the Sentinelese. For a continuous stretch of two months, laborers worked on the site of the wreckage for about 400 feet away from the coast of North uh, Sentinel. Groups of about seven to ten men worked in shifts of one week, often in close proximity to the Sentinelese, who would try to recover their share of the scrap, right? Wow, what an, what an undertaking. So here are these guys trying to recover some of, of whatever's on that boat, right? Chicken feed. And, and also the Sentinelese would come in and try to board the, the ship and get their part of that, right? Obviously, you're scavenging. It makes sense. Even before this work started, small fishing boats from Port Blair used to undertake surreptitious trips to the wreckage site to bring back loads of the cargo and scrap. These facts call into question an argument that the sight of the two fishermen at close proximity of Sentinelese coast in 2006 was a rare occasion for the hostile and isolated Sentinelese and therefore a reason for confrontation. Right, it might have happened 
much more often. So, so this kind of ends this thread and I just find this story incredibly fascinating. Till this day, you know, there's no real contact with these people. We've seen a little bit of the coconut exchange stuff. Again, at some point they're like, right, that's enough, please leave now. I appreciate that the, the government uh, of India supports this and supports the isolation and says nobody can go there. In fact, I think the guy who, um, the boat who brought this uh, 26-year-old uh, missionary to the island, I think he was penalized for it. Like he had like an incredibly high fine and I think his fishing license was revoked or something. He was penalized heavily for taking him there and breaking this rule. So I appreciate the honest effort of the Indian government just to say, because I mean, you could just rock in there with guns and take them all out. Like, who cares, right? We want to find out about this tribe, hold a gun to their head, they can't do nothing. But it's it's more of a pacifist approach, it's more of a leave them alone and leave them in their isolation approach. And I, I really appreciate this. I think this is a fascinating story and I wanted to share it with you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned a little bit about this tribe because I did and I enjoyed learning about it. So if you enjoyed the video and you learned something then please subscribe for more, smash the like button, I would appreciate to see you in another one and we are approaching 9,000 subscribers. I gotta do something, I gotta come up with something that I'm gonna do for this. Oh! If you have any ideas what I should do for 9,000 subscribers except like a giant giveaway which is not gonna happen, then leave that down in the comments. Any of your thoughts on this Sentinelese tribe, on this island or anything I spoke about Leave that in down in the comments as well. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, your take on it. Again, subscribe, like the video, and I'll see you in the next one. I'm out. Bye.